as many of you know, if, who've been followers of the center, we've hosted uh, a conference called Road to Reinvention every March. This year, of course, because of the pandemic, we had to postpone it. And as we were considering what we should do moving forward with a series of virtual events, we restructured the conference into three parts, actually. So uh, today we're I'm pleased to host sort of what we're calling the pre-conference special event, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, we're going to have a conference on October 15th for about four and a half hours uh, from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And then we're going to have a, fo a follow-up series of events focused on uh, a, a few remaining topics like digital healthcare that we want to touch on uh, after the conference itself. But as we were thinking about what we want, how we wanted to sort of redesign the conference, several things became apparent. The first thing that became apparent was that the agenda for digital transformation had pivoted quite suddenly. So it went from, you know, what must companies do, taking a lot of things for granted, but really what do we do digitally, to migrating to how do we sort of operate amidst the pandemic and, and what do we do after uh, the, the pandemic? How do we respond? How do we recover? And what we thought became uh, very important is to think beyond a single company's digital transformation strategy and to think much more broadly about what the entire industry uh, ought to be thinking about and what the role of government might be in facilitating uh, recovery and response. <clears throat> Uh, and when you think about that, because as every company pursues what they need to do, there's many things that they have in common across all of them. Um, and so with that, I, we thought about we, what we wanted to feature was somebody who would be expert in thinking about sort of the overall industry, by which I really mean sort of the software industry. If you think about all the tools that we use to, to continue to operate for those of us who are working from home, um, these are all supplied by the software industry. And obviously we've seen some stock market valuations skyrocket and so on, but fundamentally we are a software economy, which has allowed us to do as well as we have with all the challenges that the pandemic has, has brought. I thought it'd be important to focus attention on what is allowing us to actually operate during the pandemic and in many ways continue to do quite well, though obviously some industries and some companies are hurting while others are doing well. Um, so I reached out to two people that I know quite well and have known for a while. Uh, they are Victoria Espinel and uh, Ha McNeil. Victoria is the CEO of Business Software uh, Alliance, which is, uh, she is the biggest advocate, she is an advocate for uh, the software industry. Uh, and many of the software, uh, leading software companies in, in the US and in the world are members of the Software Alliance. And Ha McNeil, uh, who is, is by the way, uh, an anteater, she is a graduate of UCI, uh, is, the is the chief operating officer of Business Software Land. So with that, uh, so actually I should say a couple more things. Uh, Victoria has a long, uh, has incredible government experience. She's been in the White House in both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations. She is, was an intellectual property expert and in fact was a trade advisor negotiating intellectual property uh, agreements with uh, other nations. And, and Ha actually was a chief of staff at the TSA and also has an expertise in national security and in intellectual property enforcement. So I, uh, I couldn't think of two better experts to talk about sort of the big picture around what the pandemic is doing and what our country as a whole should be thinking about both at the government level and at the company level. So with that, welcome Victoria, welcome Ha. Uh, so I Great to see you, VJ. Good to see you too, Victoria. Good to see you, Ha. Hi, VJ. I think the color theme for today is blue. Uh, <laughs> very um, calming. Very calming, there we go. We certainly need calm at this time. So, so uh, Victoria, let's just start by sort of just hearing a little bit about you and your organization, and then how after, if you could just sort of share your perspective too on the, so, Victoria, take it away. Great, so as Vijay said, I'm the CEO of BSA, the Software Alliance. I'm also the president of software.org, our foundation. We are a global organization. We represent um, the software industry, the enterprise software industry. And at bottom, our mission is working with governments around the world to modernize laws and regulations. 
um, so that policymaking can keep pace with the very rapid advancements that we're making in technology. Huh? Sure. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a proud UC Irvine alum. Uh, I am the COO of uh, BSA, the Software Alliance, and uh, as part of that, uh, I help oversee the programs that really promote globally the licensed use of our member companies' products. Um, BSA was born global 30 years ago. It remains uh, and has a very robust global footprint in over 30 countries. And um, in addition to what is a very robust policy making uh, an advocacy shop that covers emerging issues from AI to 5G to privacy, uh, we have those programs that I mentioned that, that promote license use of our member software. So thank you both for joining us. And before I forget to the audience, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, which has actually been disabled, so you won't be able to use it. But please use the Q&A function to ask questions of Victoria and Ha. Uh, we will lean towards taking questions at the end, just because it's easier to do that way, given this format. But if you have pressing questions, please uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A. Uh, Chat in the Q&A window, I will do my best to track them and, 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 uh, trans and read them out to either Ha or Victoria. So uh, with that, uh, actually one of the things I should say is, you know, we have work with uh, at the UCI Center, we have worked with Ha and Victoria before on, on things that, uh, you know, most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about, on what is the economic impact of software to the economy, how industries are all becoming more and more software driven. And also as, as Ha referred to uh, on, on sort of software piracy because that is, is a huge sort of international issue. Uh, and Victoria also mentioned the foundation and I'm gonna bring it up again for a very important reason because we are obviously a university. And, and I think one of the things we need to think about when I visited, uh, when we went for an advisory board meeting we visited a girls school focusing on sort of STEM education. So there's a lot we have to do uh, uh, around sort of making sure that careers are open to the entire population. And uh, Victoria and how you may not know, but UCI is ranked al almost always number one or number two for doing the most for creating economic opportunity for diverse populations. But with that, uh, let's just start by sort of, uh, you know, like we said, that this event was supposed to take place in March, and now, of course, uh, we're almost six and a half, seven months into the pandemic. We're still working from home. Uh, Victoria, from where you sit uh, as the head of BSA, what is what is your sense of what your member companies are seeing, and and what does the world look like from your vantage point? So um, the world looks different for sure. You now, I think some of that change is going to be permanent. Uh, I don't think it's it's ever going to feel like 2019 again. Um, you know, I think there's, and there are a lot of different aspects of that. So as I think is true for all of us, the day-to-day -day rhythms of my life have changed a lot in the last six and a half months. Um, you know, one of the most uh, obvious ways is I used to spend a lot of time on the road meeting with government and with our team around the world. And all of those meetings are still happening, but now they are all happening virtually, which feels very, very different. The last six months has significantly accelerated digital transformation for companies around the world. And it's an interesting time to be the CEO of BSA because as BG was saying, the software industry has had such an impact and has made so many things possible in so many different aspects of our life over the last six months. So, you know, whether it's, you know, my children, distance learning from home. Um, our entire organization has worked from home. This allows me to meet with them. It allows me to be here with, with you all today. It's allowed doctors and patients to stay connected. It's allowed businesses to stay connected with their customers. And it has software is what has kept us going during the pandemic. And it's clear that software is gonna be essential um, as we look to economic recovery and reopening. So it's a, it's a fascinating time. We're going to have a chance to get more into this later on, but one thing I just wanted to say at the outset, I think it's really important as we think about how we progress in economic recovery, that we take this as an opportunity to reimagine the future and rebuild in a, in a way that accelerates digital transformation for populations as a whole. You know, one of the challenges the tech industry always has 
is to try to foresee the issues that are going to come up in the future and then try to address them proactively, really try to maximize the benefits of technology. And during the pandemic, we have seen lots of examples of, of software being used to try to help address the impacts of the pandemic. I mean, one of my, um, probably because my, um, in, in true, my father immigrated from Columbia fashion, all of his children became doctors or lawyers. So I, my father is a doctor, my brother uh, is a doctor, I'm a lawyer, my sister's a lawyer, my sister-in-law is a doctor. But so uh, maybe because of that, this example is sort of particularly near and dear to me, but I was reading that um, Imperial College in London, the doctors there that are treating COVID patients are using Microsoft HoloLens, you know, the virtual reality, so that they can be in a room treating a COVID patient and the rest of the healthcare team can be in another location in the hospital, but getting all of the information that the doctor is getting as if they were there in the room. And that has the obvious health benefit of significantly limiting the number of frontline healthcare workers that are there physically with the COVID patient, but without undermining the healthcare that that patient is getting. And, you know, that's, there, there are so many examples of that. Um, you know, another one uh, that's kind of near and dear to my heart is that uh, senior care facilities have been using Salesforce customer relations software for the first time ever, but they're using it to be able to deliver patient meals to their senior care patients that are at home and need them. And so it's been, it's been fascinating and gratifying to see all the different ways that use of software has expanded to try to help address um, the effects of the pandemic. But there are some real challenges out there. And you know, security, privacy, and access to technology are just three of, three of the challenges that we're going to need to address. Absolutely. You know, because when we think about our own, my wife is a physician who sees patients. She actually has a corporate job and she sees patients, but hasn't broken a sweat because it's now telemedicine from home. All of us have seen our doctors uh, remotely now because, you know, people don't really want to go in for routine care. Exactly. Um, and if you just look at the universities, we do, it, it's funny almost because we've talked about online education for over a decade. And if you've been around universities, we can debate everything forever. Uh, and, you know, we've discussed online education for, like I said, at least a decade, but in two weeks we were online. My favorite joke about the university is we have an undergraduate online major that is being reviewed by the campus for permission to operate. It's already online because every class is online. Um, <laughs> so formally hasn't received approval, but it's, it's up and running. Um, but, you know, you raise a good point because... It has to happen. We do have to think through sort of what will happen when the, the pandemic will end as all pandemics do. Um, and so the question becomes, what sort of life do we go back to? Uh, how, what would you like to, what's your take on all of this? How have BSA and its member companies shifted in response to the crisis? Yeah, thank you, Vijay. I mean, as Victoria mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's never gonna be 2019 again and, and life is gonna be kind of, you know, dramatically different uh, post pandemic, um, but the, the pandemic represents a really complex uh, challenges, right? a challenge that businesses and society um, have faced in, in recent history. And so we've all had to transform um, much more rapidly than we ever expected to your example about kind of going, you know, virtual online at UC Irvine within two weeks. Things that we thought were not realistic or were gonna take months or years happened in a matter of, of days and weeks, right? Um, and all of us are online now um, more than ever before. And even for us that work in tech, that, that is true as well. Um, and it's true around the world, uh, regardless of geographic boundaries or, or industry. Um, so, you know, the software industry really moved quickly to respond to, to the pandemic crisis. And uh, our member companies were at the forefront of this digital transformation, right? Um, they are the ones making the tools that they themselves and other businesses rely on to, to conduct their their day to day functions, um, and so just you know a, a couple of examples of how they've really kind of you know stepped up to the challenge um, is Splunk's global restart program. Um, they are working with businesses to uh, reopen as quickly as possible while making sure that their employees and their customers are safe, um, and they do that uh, by by gaining insights from data and um, you know using data powered software tools to support a return to work. 
uh, Microsoft, for example, uh, really stepped up and helped uh, schools and universities speed up their digital transformation by offering yep. a free version of 365, right? So all of these things, you know, are, are um, you know, as a result of, of our member companies and their, and their solutions. Um, and as businesses went virtual, um, you know, the, the solutions offered by our members really helped them to do so, but it also helped in addressing the threats of the pandemic themselves, yep. right? So Victoria mentioned Salesforce earlier for meal delivery. Uh, the state of Rhode Island uses Salesforce software to help with contract, uh, contract tracing. Right. And so, you know, that's been kind of critical in, in that line of effort. And they do so by also building, uh, you know, into their solutions considerations for very important privacy protections, for example, right? So, um, you know, I think what we know for sure is that kind of in response to the pandemic and in the recovery and in the post-pandemic world, um, technology is going to be key. Uh, and really, that's kind of at the crux of the BSA uh, response and recovery agenda. That yeah. I, and you can see that, but you know, it's so much broader than what we narrowly define as the software industry because sort of exactly. the big retailers have all added more and more software capabilities that, you know, you can go to these, uh, like a Walmart, for example, and it, their app has really evolved. But I'll give you some uh, um, sort of a, things that you may actually may or may not be, you know, you guys deal with the software industry as a whole, but we're sort of the using industry in online education. So if you watch a company like Zoom, uh, which is our platform at the university here, they have really evolved in ways that people who are not teaching might not know. So for example, you know, they, they have breakout rooms, which is something that's very crucial to teaching. But it used to be that you, you, you know, uh, you could only break, break groups in one with one algorithm. So they would actually sort of randomize it, but they couldn't allow you to put people in predetermined. Pre so they keep adding these features selectively based on the feedback they're getting from faculty about how we actually teach our classes. Uh, so there's a lot of, so this what I would call micro feature improvement that, you know, when you add them all up is going to make us, uh, you know, all better at whatever it is we do, whether we're teaching or doing something else, because one of the things that never ceases to amaze me, and I think if we hadn't gotten to the cloud or we hadn't built the infrastructure that already exists, I mean, CIOs are always in trouble with their CEO, it seems like, um, and yet we haven't, at least I haven't heard of one failure where CIOs couldn't take their entire company and move them online without too many hiccups. It really is, is speaks to sort of how robust some of these software tools are uh, and the infrastructure that we have, though that, that's clearly there's more to be done. So, so what should leaders be doing uh, considering when they map out their plans for recovery? I'll stay with you for that one. Sure. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot that we don't know about what the recovery will look like, and we're still grappling with it, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but, uh, you know, what we know is that, um, you know, we have to transform our way of doing business operations, um, delivery of government services. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we, as we look forward, what solutions and what investments can we put in place now to really build that resiliency uh, for our society and for economic growth um, so that we can adapt, you know, in the face of future crises. For governments specifically, um, they really, you know, uh, should focus on the, the need to continue to deliver services to the public, right, in, in the face of these crises. And IT infrastructure is a critical underpinning, um, you know, for, for doing that, for communicating and quick delivery of services to your constituencies. And the time to make that investment if they haven't yet done it is really now, right? right. So, um, but, but on that front, they can't go about it alone, right? And so they need to leverage the private sector and they need to ensure that in their recovery plan, they have a framework in place that really um, harnesses that collaboration and, and fosters innovation. Right. No, and, and you know, when you think about government, you're looking at, you know, there's a federal government, which at the end of the day does have resources uh, all, you know, I invariably have students in my class who work for the Orange County government or welfare agencies. And it's a completely different challenge, but to Victoria's point earlier, Salesforce is actually turning out to be uh, a fairly important set of tools for, for that uh, sector as well. But so that's, that's a big challenge. Um, I think that, that we, need to, we, we absolutely need uh, to think about. Victoria, you know, so we've sort of identified that technology will play a big role in recovery. Uh, and clearly, you know, every time there's disruption, people do well and a lot of people do worse. Uh, well, do you think people will get, you know, people will get left behind by sort of what's happening now? 
So I'm really glad you asked that question because I think that's a real risk. I think it's something that we can avoid, but we can only avoid if we are if we're working, working really hard to make sure that we don't. So, I mean, we've talked about the fact that technology clearly is crucial for governments, for businesses, for individuals. Um, one of the things that we're, we do at BSA and work with our companies to do is to try to make sure that as many people as possible can leverage technology because it's not gonna be a successful digital transformation unless as many people as possible can access it. There are two things I would highlight in particular there. First, the pandemic has only intensified the broadband gap that already existed. We hear a lot of discussion about the rural broadband gap, but there are real problems in urban areas as well. So we absolutely have to fix that. And that is gonna be, uh, that is gonna necessitate taking action at the federal level, but also at the state and local level. So fixing the broadband access problem, I think is, 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 is essential. Um, you know, you can't take advantage of the digital economy if you can't access it. Right. And it is only going to exacerbate the digital divide if we, if we don't get a handle on that quickly. The second thing I would say is that we need to make sure that young people and people that are already in the workforce today have the skills and training that they need. And there's a lot of industry effort going there. There's some government effort going there. Both industry and government need to do more and need to do it together. Um, but that is really important. And to that, I have, I have one specific suggestion for the industry leaders that are in the audience today. And that is to take a hard look at the requirements that you currently have for getting jobs in your organization. And one of the things that we have found is that a lot of companies require college degrees um, for job openings, including technology job openings, but they don't, you don't really need to have a college degree if you have the right skills. And IBM is actually a great example of a company that has done that, has taken a very hard internal look over the last couple of years. And at this point, only half the jobs in IBM require a college degree. They have eliminated that college degree requirement successfully from a lot of jobs. And it, you know, it takes some courage to move away from job requirements that might have been in place for a long time. But I think unless companies are doing that, and they, if they are not taking a hard look at those, they could be inadvertently creating barriers. Um, so if, if you are in a company where you haven't done that, I would strongly encourage you to look at your job requirements and see whether or not you're requiring things that aren't actually necessary for that job. And if you are, then to move away from those job requirements, and a four-year college degree is something I would say to take a special look at. You know, you, you, you touched on two things that are both very important to the center and to me personally. One is sort of this, this, this thing about, even though I teach in a university, I'll be the first to tell you that you don't need a university degree for lots of jobs. One of the things you may not know is that we have a community initiative partner this year and their name is Project Hope Alliance. And they help homeless kids go to school. And they have one of the most, most successful sort of rates of, they, they appoint mentors basically to take kids to school who, and there's a lot of kids uh, who may not belong to the demographic that people usually think about when we talk about who's homeless. But uh, we were about to launch a program educating them in coding. Uh, we, ha we had a software boot camp lined up for these kids because they don't have exposure to what a software job could look like. And the reason we picked that, of course, is what the center does. But the bigger reason we picked it was, it was many of these kids will not have the resources to go to college or the infrastructure, the social infrastructure to go to college. And we thought we put them through a two week program, identify who's interested, who's got the aptitude. Then we could actually fund online education for them because you know LinkedIn is offering it, Alphabet's offering it. There's a, you know, you, there's a lot, Microsoft, there's a lot of, LinkedIn is basically Microsoft. Uh, a lot of companies offering education, but if you're willing to hire these people, I think that's really important. Which goes to the second question about the digital divide. When I was sort of entered this field, the digital divide was about who has a PC and who doesn't. And, and now it's much more about who has access. So we actually have a question from Laura McFall that I'm gonna to go to. Has the moment come to characterize internet connectivity and access as a utility versus a discretionary service? Victoria, do you wanna take that? So, you know, I think there's a, there's a legal answer to that and a non-legal answer and that they, as a person who has a law degree but actually hasn't practiced law for a long time, I'm going to lightly elide on the legal and then move to the non-legal. You know, there are um, regulatory consequences for an industry becoming a utility. And um, I don't think 
anyone has kind of done the hard thinking to see whether or not the kinds of regulatory oversight that being a utility requires are appropriate here. Um, that's not to say that there aren't other kinds of tech regulations that are not, that, that, you know, there are some kinds of tech regulations that we think are very clearly appropriate, but all the sort of legal consequences that would be, that would come with being called a utility for regulatory oversight practices isn't something I think that's been well thought through. However, I think the broader non-legal point you're making that access to broadband is, a, is an essential component of being part of the modern economy, that is completely true. And that is why I think, um, you know, industry and government together have to work uh, much more quickly than they have to try to fix the broadband access problem. We have certainly been telling Congress for a long time, and we have fully intensified those efforts now in the COVID pandemic, that they need, this needs to be part of how they think about COVID recovery. And there are some members of Congress um, and state legislators that, that understand that, um, but there is more uphill work to be done there. Um, you know, we'll keep pushing because it, it's obviously critical. Yeah, I, and is it also true that we have more expensive internet access relative to other countries? Well, as in other countries, it is subsidized. So I guess it depends on who, expensive to whom. Yeah. Um, and, and who is subsidizing the cost of that. We also have, a, you know, there are countries that have higher density populations, which reduces costs. Um, but, you know, I think it, it has to be, again, it has to be a combination. Industry needs to be making those investments and, and the government needs to be supporting them in doing that. So, so now that we sort of identified that software is really sort of central to our future and in our previous conversations, we've talked about every job is really at some level a software job because either you're a coder and if you're not a coder, you're a clicker. And I don't think there's a single one, there's a single person on this call because you couldn't have gotten this call without clicking uh, mm -hmm. and so you're a clicker. Uh, what does that mean? So if every if every job is either a software job is a is a coding job or a clicking job, how what does that mean for people who are trying to get ready for the digital economy? Like what kinds of skills do they need around software? Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess to your point, yes. You know, we obviously uh, believe that you know every job is a software job, and we we know uh, based on on you know our studies and our research that. Uh, software is, is a critical component of, of the global economy, right? Um, even pre-pandemic, some of the numbers that we were looking at showed that the software jo jobs grow at twice the pace of, of jobs in, in other industry sectors. So, um, so what we're going to see is that, you know, the software industry has more jobs that it can fill. And so to your point, it is going to be really important uh, to build that pipeline of people who have um, the digital skills necessary to, to fill those jobs. But to get back to what Victoria was saying earlier, you know, we need to get away from that kind of, you know, mentality of uh, what does that look like? Does it require a four-year degree? And be creative in how we we approach that. Um, and one example in, that we're, you know, of, of of an effort that we're doing via our foundation is um, we've launched a site called, called Transform Your Trade. And what that site does is really connect people um, who are in their earlier or mid careers um, to free skills training from uh, our member you know, uh, companies to really jumpstart a career in software. And if you take a look at that, it kind of spans everything from kind of, you know, the, the, uh, the arts and design, you know, via Adobe training or Salesforce training um, or kind of manufacturing and operations training. Um, and so really it's such a, a gamut, but all of those uh, different areas require some kind of digital uh, literacy, right? And so, right. Um, you know, it's broader than what you think of traditionally as- um, Absolutely. You know, it, it is, a, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a plug because we've been, you know, at the business school, our business school is dedicated training leaders for a digitally driven world. And because we're doing all this online education, I'm now training myself to use video editing software and movie production software so I can deliver classes from home. And I used to be a pretty good coder when I was in grad school. I paid part of my way through grad school by coding for professors. Um, and, and that still holds me in good stead because I'm able to, I find that this is a little bit of a boast, I guess, to actually navigate some of this soft, software very, very easily because I sort of understand the mind of the coder. Uh, uh, and you, and once you understand how software works, a lot of sort of navigating the world becomes, I think, a, a little bit uh, easier. But 
I actually said that as a little bit of a setup to the question I got from uh, Praveen Dathar, who I'm like, that's a blast from the past. He was my student probably 15 years ago now. At, last I heard he was at SAP. <laughs> but he's actually asking a really interesting question about the creativity you need to build software. And whether you, are you hearing anything from your member companies or like is work from home as good? Everybody talks about work from home. Even now we keep reading about, well, productivity hasn't suffered. We're all quite productive from home, but are we sacrificing anything on the creative end? Can we be, you know, trying to, uh, Victoria used the phrase, reimagine the future. Um, are we as good at that or can we cope somehow with the next generation of products and services that we, we will need in a work from home environment? So, you know, I would say, speaking for BSA and speaking for companies, that, well, speaking for BSA, I've been really impressed how well we have worked remotely. And, and I think a lot of that, uh, as is true in many companies, just goes to the dedication of the team and kind of figuring it out. Um, but I don't think it's most people's preferred way of working. And there are a couple of things that I, that I that I worry about. You've touched on one of them, but before that, I mean, one of the things I worry about starting with my own team is, and, and, I, and I love the dedication, but people have been working so hard and blur. And so we've actually put some practices in place to try to make sure that people are taking time off and that people are taking breaks because, you know, on the one hand, as a CEO, I, I kind of love that the team, many people on the team were just like work, 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 work 24 seven, but it's actually not good for them. And it's not good for us as an organization. And so I think that's one thing, you know, we've done a few very intentional things. Like we, uh, we now have a mandated, for as long as we work from home, every person in the organization has to take one day a month. And the only rule for that day is that they cannot they cannot see their work email. They cannot get work text. They're, they're not supposed to think about work in any way. Um, you know, we're calling the mental health days. We've done other things just to try to make sure that people are getting breaks in their day. So I think that's a, that's a challenge. And it goes to the creativity because it's hard to be creative if you're getting burnt, right? Um, second thing is, and again, I, our team has been amazing. Um, but I do think it's not impossible. We've actually had some good, we just had our global, we had our virtual global staff retreat last week and there were some really good creative brainstorms that we had virtually with teams, you know, that were sitting in the United States, sitting in Europe, sitting in Asia all together. So we can definitely be done. But I do think there is something to people being in the same room. And so I don't think it will, I think the creativity will be there. But I do think there's some amount of diminution that you know it's gonna be very hard to measure that comes from not being able to be in the same room. I also right. don't think, I mean, we're gonna get past this, right? And so what we may end up is in a situation where a lot of people are working from home, you know, more days a week in ways that are actually great for them and really flexible and avoiding the commutes and you know, all of that but are then very intentionally getting together and having like creative brainstorms together. You know, I, I think that's where we're gonna end up. And I think that in-person interaction is, is always gonna be valuable. But yeah. uh, the last thing I'll say is just, you know, going kind of what you were saying, BJ, you know, companies like Zoom have been so quickly responding to customer demand, even in this virtual world. So I think it's, you know, it's clear that the creativity is there and the creativity is still happening. Now, and I also look at sort of empirical evidence, right? Companies like Pinterest are willing to pay huge penal financial penalties to give up their newly rented headquarters in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you write that, I think it's like an $85, $90 million check to walk out of the lease. That tells you one, probably they don't expect to be back at work, but they also don't think that it, uh, that they think they can get by without it. Uh, right. And, you know, a lot of the other big software companies have done the same, same thing. I have, I'm going to do one more question while I give, give the audience time to uh, type in your questions. So please feel free to start typing in your questions to the Q&A session. Uh, so, you know, one of, the things, one of the things we really do want to talk about is the response and recovery agenda. For those of you who joined a little bit late, that is actually in the chat, the link to the agenda. So please go to the website and download it. But talk about that, Victoria, the, the response and recovery agenda. Sure, I'd be happy to. So, you know, when all of this started happening, we, uh, we at BSA moved really quickly 
to start working on what we call a response and recovery agenda. And that was working with governments around the world on, on two things. First was looking to how we respond to the immediate impacts of, the, of COVID. And the second part of that is looking at how we're gonna use technology to recover from the health and economic effects of the pandemic. Um, so just to give a few concrete examples uh, of what that means, you know, when we're looking at the immediate impacts, one of the things that we were looking, working with governments around the world is to make sure that the government and businesses had access to these tools that we're talking about. So they, they had the access and the resources that they needed so that they could, they could do what they do. They could manage the payroll, they could reach their customers, they could reach their citizens. Um, and there are, there are many examples, um, and, and these will play out over, you know, these will be upgraded over time, but I think it, it really highlighted to the companies and, and certainly to many governments that the legacy IT systems they had were not adequate to deal with the situation at hand um, and needed to be addressed. You know, a second very sort of practical, concrete thing that we worked on is one of the immediate aspects was making sure that IT workers were essential workers in, you know, in the United States and in other countries so that IT workers could do what they do and make sure that um, we were all able to stay connected. Um, a big part of the response recovery agenda is looking to the future, as I said, and thinking about, okay, so how are we going, how are we going to come out of this? And, and how, how do we want to come out of this to recover? Um, we have a whole host of uh, recommendations that we're working with governments on. Um, just very briefly, you know, one I've already mentioned, so broadband access, as you can imagine, you know, in expanding the access to universal high-speed internet is very high on that list. Um, a second one we've already talked about is thinking about the global workforce, reimagining that, what kind of STEM education, what kind of training that do we need. Um, but there's a whole host of other recommendations, and, and I would um, I would uh, encourage people to go and read it. One of the things that we are working on is trying to make sure that data can move back and forth across borders because we need it for more collaboration. Um, trying to ensure that companies and governments are being very thoughtful about security and privacy. So we've talked about the need to move quickly and that's really important. But it's, I know that um, certainly for the BSA members as they are moving quickly, bearing in mind that the software solutions they create also need to be very focused on the privacy of their of their customers and of the the, the privacy and security of the data that's being collected. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting conversations coming out of this on that topic. But you know that's that that is key to this um, is key to thinking about how we want to come out of the of the pandemic. You know, the TikTok deal is sort of very interesting for that reason, because it's code and this data. We don't have to go into that, but we got a really interesting uh, question from Mario Diaz here. So he wants to know about sort of your take, either of you, I guess, on taxation, payroll, and labor laws when working from home or hiring people in other regions or countries to work remotely. You know, I've seen this in the newspapers too, which is, right, it's I'm living in Connecticut and I used to go to Manhattan to work and now I'm only gonna stay in Connecticut. So how does it affect taxation? Is that something that your organization deals with and do you have a point of view? So that's not something that we are, that's not something we have an official position on. Um, it's certainly something that I've thought about and I and imagine a lot of companies are thinking about as, as their employees are able to work in other locations. And that's certainly, we've tried to be very flexible with that. We've had, we have employees that are no longer working in the state of the United States where they were. And we've had employees that are no longer working in the country where they were because they've gone you know, to be with their family and be in other locations. Um, and there are going to be, I think, some really thorny tax questions and tax assessments as all of that plays out. Happily, I am not a tax lawyer for the government. So I'm, I'm not in the position, but you know, I think that's, I think there's going to be uh, I think there's going to be a lot of questions around that, and you know, sort of looking against the future, maybe that starts to change how people think about the tax system. I mean, it's you know, it's Uber, it's uh, I should, I should, Uber maybe a bad example, bad word to use in this context, but it's hyper jurisdictional, right? Yes. City tax, the local taxes, the state taxes, the federal taxes, and you can understand 
Why? Because it goes to fund those services that are so important. But if people are moving around as rapidly, you know, is that, is that a system that starts to meld together a bit? Um, the last thing I'll say on this, and this, this is not a BSA position, but I, you know, I am aware that, um, you know, there are states in the United States that are beefing up their internal tax investigation departments because they are assuming uh, or they are planning they to be doing more audits of people that have moved to states that don't have state income tax, for example. So like, you know, New York's internal department looking at people that have moved to Florida or Texas or other places. Um, but, you know, on the, at the same time, that's a legitimate choice. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that should not be, I don't think that's, well, I'm not going to comment on why people are moving from state to state, but I do think there, I do think there's likely to be a whole um, uh, increase in those kinds of investigations yeah. as this plays out. So one of the things we haven't talked about yet, and it's a sort of a curveball, but, but every, a lot of people seem to uh, are concerned about sort of election security and software. Um, is that an issue that do you think is something we need to worry about? Obviously, we have an election in 40 days, give or take. Uh, I think it's. I think it might be 40 days on the nose. Um, so, you know, the BSA members are not um, that I'm aware of. The software companies that are um, involved in election software. So again, um, I have I have views on it. They're not sort of BSA official views. Um, and I think, um, so, I, so at a very, very high level, I would say, you know, I think the ability to try to have increased um, virtual voting, you know, perhaps even one day voting by phone, in my own personal non-BSA view, is a good thing because I think it will help increase voter access. Um, I think we want to try to take down as many barriers to voter access as we can. Um, regardless of political party, we want to try to make it as easy for people to participate and the, um, in the in our political system as we can. Um, obviously, even in putting aside any question of it, you know deliberate interference, there are just going to be significant security concerns in the same way that we're seeing increased cybersecurity concerns because of the proliferation of IoT devices sure. in general. Um, but again, not as a not as a BSA position. I do think the security concerns will be managed over the medium term, um, shall we say. And I think if we can increase the amount of electronic voting or voting by phone, you know, again, maybe over the medium, the long term, that's gonna be a benefit to our society. Let me just ask one last question of both of you because we're getting close to the magic hour, the magic minute. So where do we go from here? What's next? What does the future hold? Well, that's a good place to end, I think. Uh, how do you wanna go first and I'll go to Victoria after that? Or Either way, I, I'm, I'm easy. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, there's, in the face of challenges, there are big opportunities, right? And so to take it back to the question earlier about kind of employee mobility and all of that and bring it back full circle, you know, if we can, we, if we can really wrap our heads around how to, you know, enable that and really, you know, uh, build a, a framework of, you know, tax and whatever rules and laws that, that really help promote that, you know, there are real opportunities there in terms of closing the, the jobs gap that, that you know, we're, we're actively trying to, you know, make sure we have a healthy pipeline for it, right? And so I think, you know, looking at uh, beyond some of the, the barriers that we have seen uh, traditionally in terms of geography and industry and all of that, will yield some real, some real positives and some real opportunities coming out of this challenge. Victoria? Um, so I would say three things. One is, even before COVID, we needed more coders in the software industry. Um, so you know, anything that we can do to train and inspire the next generation of coders, I think it's gonna be key. Um, and we haven't had a chance to talk about diversity, but clearly that is an area where the industry has challenges, is working to address them, needs to do more. Um, so that's, that, is a very important first point. Um, a second point is that I think one of the key lessons of the last few months has been the value of reliable, trustworthy data. And I think this has proved that, that is even more essential when we are in a time of crisis. Um, and that's in part so that our decision makers in, in government can make safe decisions. 
So as we are moving to reopen and, and uh, sustain our economy, I think we need to make sure that those decisions are being guided by very thoughtful uses of reliable data and by increased sharing of data. And so actually I wanted to mention that one of the things BSA is, has done to try to help with that um, a couple of months ago, we launched something called the Open Data Agenda. I'd be happy to share it with the group, but essentially what we're trying to do is help bridge that data divide and encourage more data sharing among governments and industry, um, more data sharing across industry sectors, which is, I think is an area we have a real challenge that we need to, to fix, um, and more data sharing around the world. So I think that is that you know trustworthy, reliable data, and then trying to make sure that data is shared effectively is a second very important point. Um, and the third thing is, and kind of picking up on something Hop was saying, I think we need government policies that support software innovation, but that also bring jobs to where people are. So one of the things that the pandemic has demonstrated is our capacity to re for remote work. Um, it has also demonstrated you know, where we have holes to fill in that capacity, and we've talked about that. But we have a real opportunity now as a society to take advantage of remote work that's enabled by software so that people all over the country can either keep working in the job they have or get a new role um, or a new job. And I really wanna emphasize the point of all over the country. We have the opportunity now, again, through remote work enabled by software to spread jobs and economic opportunity across the United States to parts of the United States where they have not existed um, in the way that they should. And so I, to my mind, I, I wanna end on that because I think that's one of the biggest opportunities we have in terms of reimagining the future and an opportunity that we should really seize. Yeah, that is the perfect place to end because from our perspective, me as a university professor or center being part of the university, we see that every single day because, you know, at UC Irvine, we really see education as the opportunity. And we ought not to think about all software jobs as being advanced machine learning jobs, building autonomous cars. There's plenty of well-paying jobs, you know, building and managing websites or doing something that's more routine. And I, I do think it's our responsibility to spread the wealth, if you will. Yes. And it, there's plenty of jobs to go around and plenty of work to go around. It's, it, there's, there's a huge reskilling challenge in, in front of us, but thank you for highlighting these important issues, Ha huh, and Victoria. Really appreciate your spending time with us. Uh, I think this has been really, really uh, informative and uh, thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for attending. A few closing comments. Our conference is on October 15th. If you're interested in, uh, in attending, we, we actually only have a few seats left but please go to our website and, and register. You will get a, a poll after this. So we would love your feedback. We always try to improve. Uh, just be nicer to me than you are in your student evaluations. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, uh, and, and we always look forward to suggestions and recommendations from our audience members and our community. We were very good at figuring out what the community needed when the world was somewhat static. And now we're, you know, the world has changed, so we would welcome input, we always do, but more so now than ever. So again, thank you all for showing up and attending and uh, helping us get our message out and learning more about how we can improve society and the economy. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Ha. Uh, and goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for having us. Our pleasure. Bye-bye.